today we're going to engage an aspect of Japan that's both hugely important and, for a historian, extremely difficult, the family. Now the reasons why it's hugely important may be obvious. How parents raise their children is one of the main ways in which culture and tradition are conveyed from generation to generation. When we generalize and say that the Japanese act this way, or Australians do it this way, or the French do that, we're talking about habits and attitudes that are first learned in the home. How to eat, how to address strangers, when to smile. This is stuff you learn at home from a very young age. And what makes for a good marriage partner? What do you look for? These are the things that we begin to learn before we are even aware of it, by watching our parents. So families are one of the main ways that societies transmit values and traditions. But what's frustrating for the historian is that we know about the past primarily through written records. And for most of human history, the written record neglects mundane aspects of daily life. For example, there is no 1457 Japanese version of Dr. Spock's Baby and Child Care. There is no 1607 Japanese edition of What to Expect When You're Expecting. And there's absolutely positively no 1715 edition of How to Know If It's Time to Go. Those sorts of dense and explicit discussions of what a good family should look like, those are a modern phenomenon. So historians, we find ourselves using lots of indirect sources. We can get at least some idea of family life from indirect testimony about family values, from literature, of course, and from documents like wills and legal proceedings. When we look at divorce records, for example, we can get some idea of how husbands and wives were expected to treat each other. That is, we can look at failed marriages to infer what was considered proper. So bearing in mind the challenges of using indirect sources, let's try a sweep through about 10 centuries of Japanese history, starting with the court society of the Heian era, and ending with the Japanese family today. And to organize our discussion, let's identify three main models of the Japanese family. First, there's the aristocratic model, or the uji. Second, there's the samurai model, or the ie. And finally, there's the modern model of Japanese family life. Now historically, those three models overlap to some degree, but we can think of the Uji model as dominant until the 1200s or so, and the Ie model as dominant from the 1300s until the 1900s, and the modern family as largely a post-war phenomenon. So how are these family systems different? Well, both the Uji and the Ie models featured lots of kids and lots of intergenerational connections, whereas the modern Japanese family is largely a nuclear family, two parents and one or two children. So one important difference is scale, but the other is structure. Uji were sprawling family units with lots of branches and complex kinship ties. Uji basically means clan. Ie, by contrast, means household. And the Ie family model was more linear, with a clear patriarch and a clear single-stranded line of succession. So let's start with the Uji model. This is a model that was quite suitable for a marriage politics approach to power. You have lots of daughters and lots of sons, and you marry them all over the place. Then you have lots of in-laws and nieces and nephews and grandchildren 
all over the place. And then you can use blood ties to build a dense web of political alliances. This sort of marriage politics was a central feature of Heian period Japan. And you may recall that the master of marriage politics was Fujiwara no Michinaga, who lived from 966 to 1028. Now, to allow for these fluid webs of power, Heian marriage had multiple patterns. In fact, it's difficult to describe exactly how marriages worked in Heian aristocratic families because there are so many variations. A husband and wife could live separately. They could live together with the wife's parents. They could live together with the husband's parents or form their own household. Even after marriage, however, noble women kept control of their own property. In fact, they could dispose of it without their husband's approval. Heian era women wrote their own wills. Now, it's sometimes tempting to make a strict contrast between matriarchy and patriarchy, and Heian society offers us a good reason not to do that. Because in the Heian court, keeping women independent in their marriage often served their father's interests. Remember, at the apex of power, the game was to marry your daughter to the emperor so that the next emperor could be your grandson. So keeping women independent in marriage was partly about securing power for their fathers. In any case, the Uji model, with its webs of interaction, was strikingly different from the Ie model of later samurai society. That model was for a society built on war. And I like to think of the Ia system as a military command model of the family. Dense webs of influence are fine in court politics, but not so good in battle where you want a clear and unitary command structure. And this helps us understand why the Ia system did not favor partible inheritance. If you controlled a 20,000-man army, well, you'd want to pass that military power down as a whole, wouldn't you? Breaking a 20,000-man army into two 10,000-man armies is bad, and breaking it down into five 4,000-man armies is even worse. Big armies tend to trounce smaller armies. And unless, I guess, your two daughters and your three sons can act as one, then splitting a samurai inheritance five ways is a bad idea. In fact, if the inheritance is a military command, should those two daughters get anything at all? Now, this contrast between the aristocratic families of the Heian court and the samurai families of later centuries this contrast is useful so long as we realize that the early samurai still thought a lot like courtiers. The shift from the Uji system to the Ie system was a gradual transition. In fact, in the 1200s and the 1300s, the legal codes of the first shogunate in Kamakura showed a strong courtier influence. Women still had the powers of Heian society. For example, according to Kamakura law, if a man gave property to his wife and he then divorced her, he could only reclaim the land if he could prove that she was guilty of some serious transgression. And early samurai law seems to have enabled women to perpetuate their own family lines independent of their husbands. Childless women or women without sons could adopt a male heir to convey property. Moreover, when women inherited their husband's land rights, the shogunate allowed them to manage the land just like any male vassal would. Yes, women hired proxies to do certain vassal duties, like military service, but they could manage the estates on their own. Now, this period of fluidity produced one of the most powerful women in Japanese history. 
Hojo Masako. Masako was the wife of the first Kamakura shogun, Minamoto no Yoritomo, and she was arguably the single most powerful person in the early 1200s. In fact, the Hojo family displaced the Minamoto. Hojo men ruled as regents to child shoguns, and for all practical purposes, the Minamoto line died out as a ruling house. In fact, the disappearance of the Minamoto is one reason I refer to the regime founded by Minamoto no Yoritomo as the Kamakura shogunate rather than the Minamoto shogunate. The regime started as the Minamoto shogunate, but it effectively became the Hojo shogunate. The one constant was the capital city, Kamakura. So what did Hojo Masako do? Well, she effectively ran the Kamakura shogunate after her husband's death in 1199. She did not remarry. That might have raised questions about her loyalty and chastity. Instead, she became a Buddhist nun. But that was simply a cover to allow her to wield power indirectly. She's sometimes referred to as the nun shogun, the Abba shogun. Now, as a power behind the throne, Masako removed male figureheads who opposed her, including her own son and her own father. She was also instrumental in rallying Minamoto vassals to crush an uprising against the shogunate in 1221. Now, what's noteworthy about Hojo Masako's life is that she commonly ruled in concert with a male relative her son, or her father, or her brother. And she was discreet about her power. But there's no question that she was decisive in sustaining the Hojo and their control over the shogunate. And we can think of Hojo Masako as emblematic of women in the early stages of warrior rule, when women could still control their own property and manage their own affairs. However, this began to break down in the late 13th century. As samurai culture developed, so did the Ie system I described a moment ago. The decisive factor was probably the Mongol invasions of 1274 and 1281. Resisting the Mongols required real combat, and having women send proxies really didn't fit that need. But in any case, by the late 1300s, women had largely lost the right to inherit or amass property. And families began to have a single clear male patriarch who had commanding authority over his wife and children. Again, it helps to think of this as a military model of the family, in which a samurai's relationship to his lord became a model for how a patriarch should be treated within his own household. So a woman initiating a divorce from her husband is like a samurai initiating a divorce from his lord, and that's called desertion. A woman disobeying her husband is like a samurai disobeying his lord, which is insubordination. And a woman having an extramarital affair that's like a samurai serving another lord altogether, which is sedition. To put it another way, in the ES system, when a woman marries, she enters her husband's household. She effectively severs ties with her birth family and becomes a member of her husband's family. Or, to put it in military terms, there are no dual loyalties. Interestingly, under the ES system, the power of the household head, the patriarch, was not limited to power over women and children. Household heads also had authority over their siblings. You see, a patriarch was commonly succeeded by a single patriarch, usually his eldest son, and that meant that everyone in the household was under that eldest son, not just the son's wife, but also his brothers and sisters, 
The sisters, at least until they married, and entered someone else's house. And because the Ia system did not favor partible inheritance, younger sons often needed their elder brother's permission to marry because a younger brother's wife would be entering the elder brother's household. And any children of that marriage would be members of the elder brother's household. This structure gave rise to the Japanese saying, the sibling is the beginning of the stranger, or kyodai wa tanin no hajimari. Because within the Ia system, younger siblings, especially brothers, had great reason to resent their father's chosen heir. Now, we've been talking so far about elite families, the Heian aristocracy, and the samurai families of later centuries. And that's because until the 1600s, our knowledge of commoner families is extremely limited. But beginning in the 1600s, with the economic boom of the Tokugawa peace, and with the spread of basic literacy, we start to get a better understanding of how commoners lived. And when we look at the historical record, there's a striking contrast between samurai and commoner approaches to family life. Now, early modern laws reflected samurai attitudes. So legal documents tended to squeeze commoner families into a samurai mold. But farm families simply didn't think about women in the same way. For farm families, some level of compatibility between husband and wife was important, especially if it was a less wealthy family and the couple really needed to work together to make ends meet. So attitudes towards both marriage and divorce were different. For a samurai woman, leaving your husband and returning to your parents' house was parallel to a soldier deserting his post. But commoners weren't soldiers, so that analogy didn't hold. Instead, we find that farm families also placed a greater emphasis on marital happiness, or at least compatibility. Here's an account that's both amusing and informative. The story involves a traveler in the Shinano region. The traveler was staying overnight with a farm family, and after dinner, the newlyweds in the family excuse themselves, and in the large main room, separated only by a screen, they began to have sex. Now the guest remarked that this was not quite right, and his host threatened to throw him out. She explained that harmony between husband and wife is the cornerstone of prosperity, so nothing could be more auspicious than newlywed passion. In cases of divorce, farm families were also more willing to take daughters back and help them remarry. Now, commoner women did not have the legal right to initiate divorce. So sometimes they would leave their husbands to visit their sick parents and then just not come back. And sometimes the legal documents show that the parents were never really sick although they were willing to take their daughters back. In other cases, unhappy women used temples to get a divorce. Although the women themselves did not have legal standing, many temples would give them a divorce, because if a woman agreed to become a nun, then her husband was impeding her spiritual progress by opposing a divorce and opposing the temple by not granting her a divorce. Frequently, though, once women got a divorce, they just returned to the laity and returned to their parents. In fact, there were temples in Japan that were known as divorce temples. Now, this leads to something of a paradox in Tokugawa marriage, because wealthier farm families, families who were social climbers, they wanted to imitate samurai families. They might even send a daughter to a samurai household to work as a servant so she could learn the ways of the upper class. 
So in wealthier commoner families, women had less freedom in marriage than in poor families. They entered arranged marriages at an earlier age than girls from poor families, who were often allowed to choose their own marriage partners. So ironically, while wealthier women certainly had more opportunities for a rich cultural life, in terms of freedom in marriage, poor women had more choice. Okay, we've examined family life from the Heian era through the Tokugawa shogunate. But what about modern times? Well, with the Meiji Restoration, the new government attempted to create a national standard of civil law. They didn't complete that project until the 1890s, but they wiped away all the idiosyncrasies of local laws and customs. And to a large degree, these reforms pushed samurai attitudes towards the family onto the rest of society. Meiji law sort of merged samurai and Victorian attitudes towards the family and effectively codified the idea that women have inferior rights to men. So ironically, women actually lost some rights in the late 19th century. In some Tokugawa era villages, for example, property holding households voted to elect their village headmen. And while household heads were commonly men, widows with young children could serve as household heads. And in those circumstances, women voted. But then in the Meiji era, those women lost the right to vote. So to truly explore the modern model of family life, we need to look beyond the Meiji Restoration because the striking change in family structure didn't come until the U.S. occupation after World War II. And the first thing we notice is a huge change, stemming largely from the post-war constitution. That constitution was heavily influenced by U.S. progressive politics. The constitution, for example, has an equal rights clause Women are fully equal to men before the law. And family law must be based on, quote, individual dignity and the essential equality of the sexes. The Constitution also stipulates that marriage should be, quote, maintained through mutual cooperation with the equal rights of husband and wife as a basis. So in constitutional law, Japan is a paradise of gender equality, except that some aspects of the Japanese civil code still reflect the old IA system. For example, in Japan, everyone is registered in a koseki, a household register. And since everyone in a household should have the same family name, the koseki system makes it difficult for women to keep their original family name after marriage. Now, while this is just technically an administrative matter, it tends to collide with the constitutional idea that everyone is equal and everyone is an individual before the law. The Koseki system also complicates divorce. Japanese law really does not provide for joint custody of children. If the parents split, the child goes with one party or the other, with one ie or the other. You can't be in between. I encountered this personally when I tried to go to Japan on sabbatical with my wife's children by her first marriage. The foreign ministry quickly approved my visa and my wife's visa, but they could not figure out what to do with my stepchildren. We had a letter from their biological father saying that he fully approved of the trip. But their visa applications went from the foreign ministry to the justice ministry, where the paperwork sat while someone struggled to figure out what this could mean in terms of Japanese law. To whom did these kids belong? But perhaps the biggest challenge for families in modern Japan is the low birth rate and the low rate of family formation. In the 1920s, a Japanese woman had, on average, more than five children. It dropped to around two in the 1950s, 
and today it's around 1.4. Now, Japan's low birth weight is not remarkable for an economically developed country. It's about the same as Italy and Germany, and it's higher than South Korea. But many people don't make that connection. For example, I once had an Italian colleague tell me with a straight face that the low birth rate in Japan resulted from the terrible status of women, but in Italy it was because women were having so much fun. Now in reality, of course, it's both, both reasons in both Japan and Italy. In both countries, women are delaying marriage and limiting fertility because they can earn money independently and they can travel and enjoy themselves. But at the same time, in both countries, child rearing is extremely demanding, government support is limited, and neither Italian nor Japanese men are known for their great willingness to share chores like diaper changing. And when it comes to finding a man to marry, well, until the 1980s, a Japanese man with a white collar job in a major corporation could count on steady employment for the rest of his life. And that made him an attractive marriage partner. But Japan's long recession has undermined that career path. And in Japan, as almost everywhere in the world, men with low incomes and unstable jobs are much less attractive as marriage partners. Now, for years, the Japanese government has been in a state of mild panic over low Japanese fertility. Because Japan has the highest life expectancy in the world, and therefore demographers see a tidal wave of gray in Japan's future, a huge population of elderly men and women, and a shrinking working age population and therefore a shrinking tax base. And one obvious solution is to make it possible for women to both raise children and participate in the labor force, because that way you get both taxable workers now and babies, a future generation of taxable workers. But for years, neither the government nor Japanese business could get out of the mindset that women should stay home with the children, while ambitious men worked 70-hour weeks. But things seem to have snapped in 2005, when the Japanese population actually began shrinking. Deaths outnumbered births for the first time since the last years of World War II. And as a result, the government has been talking a new language since 2005. Japanese bureaucrats discovered flex time. They discovered work-life balance. And they began talking about the need for government and business to support working men and women, both as parents, in law and in policy. This is a sea change from the attitudes that prevailed in Japan for most of the post-war era. Now, the early results are actually promising. The birth rate stopped dropping and has actually ticked up a bit since 2005. But reversing Japan's shrinking population will only happen as part of a series of broader changes, changing attitudes towards family structure, a new understanding of gender roles, and new attitudes towards work in an era of sluggish economic growth. And if that sounds familiar, it's because many of the challenges facing Japanese families are similar to those facing families around the developed world.